the Chusky Boys. And this is Chad with Hemlock. What does a Chusky Boy look like? Chusky Boys, what's that? Chusky Boys. Not to be confused with Husky Boys. Mm. The Chusky Boys. Well, I believe y'all guys are listening to the Chusky Boys. This is William Duvall, and you are listening to the Chusky Boys. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are episode 13 of the Chusky Boys and Dusty Lucky once 13. again. Lucky number 13, a baker's dozen, outdone yourself. You have ha- had John, coach John Stiegelmeyer, coach of South Dakota State University since 1997, joining us. Coach, how are you doing today? Uh, every day is a super day, you know, and uh, I uh, this time of year, I my measure is if the car starts, it's a good day, and the car started, so... Uh, some of the with some day. of the extreme cold that we have, that is a good day. That is a good day. Well, I, I've had a car when I was younger that would not start in the cold, and I know how frustrating that is. So, Coach, what was your first car? Uh, my, well, I grew up on a farm, so my first car, my dad uh, was uh, a visionary, so we, we bought a pickup. My brother and I bought a pickup together, my younger right. brother. But with with my wife, it was a Ford Pinto, I, I think is what it was. So, oh, nice. My first vehicle ever was a Honda Accord. I think it was a 1994, and I think it was it was it was minged is what they called it, which is supposed to like make it super nice or something like wash well. It, it all it did was cause cause a bunch of rust. It was a complete rust bucket. One of the most reliable <laughs> vehicles I've ever had, though, to be honest with you. <laughs> My first car was a '72 Plymouth Duster with a four speed. I wish I'd have kept that car. Very nice. We all said that about our first cars. Well, Coach Heck, what a what a busy day today, signing day. Um, Tell us about that. You got a whole bunch of kids on your social media that you brought in, uh, some local kids, some out-of-state kids. Who are a couple of the ones you want to talk about? Well, you know, it's our second signing day, so it's uh, we added these guys to the to the December group. And I, I guess probably a couple guys, uh, the two kids from uh, Colorado, Bryce and Dante. Uh, Bryce is a linebacker. Uh, Dante is a safety uh, we got on those guys late. Both those guys were offered by Colorado State. They committed to Colorado State because of the, you know the local school. And then when they when they got rid of their staff out there, they dropped their scholarship off. So we were really fortunate to get in on them late. Uh, Coach Jimmy Rogers found them, if you will. We went out there uh, last week, and and uh, the it turned out pretty well. So we're excited about those two guys. But really, uh, if he, if a young man's a non scholarship guy or a scholarship guy. I look at them all the same, like they're going to be uh, four four year starters, and that's just my personality. Sure, it's a good way to look at things. How many of your of your uh, your athletes there are full red scholarships? Then is there like a max amount you can have? Yeah, good question. Um, the rules in FCS football is uh, FBS gets eighty five full scholarships, so Nebraska has eighty five full scholarships. FCS gets 85 guys on scholarship, but we only get 63 equivalencies. And so what that means is a young man, if he gets a, it gets a, a half and another young man gets a half, that counts as one of those equivalencies. So in answer to your question, many of our signees don't come in on uh, full scholarships. Probably a third of them do. And then as they grow in the program, we bump them up and, and bring guys in at, at a lower scholarship. So uh, there's a lot of different methods of doing it. I want to have 85 guys on scholarship so that, uh, you know, we have guys that uh, we're taking care of. And we have, a, like this last year, we had 18 guys on the team that walked on here. I hate the term walk on, but there were non-scholarship guys that earned scholarships. That, I think, is the real world. I love doing that. That's amazing. I mean, especially for a football program like you guys have. Let's talk about that. So it's 2022 now. We're just into the new year. But last year because of this crazy COVID situation, you actually had played two seasons in one year and you had like, what was it like three, four, maybe five weeks between season A and season B, if you will. Well, we, we finished, we lost, we lost the national championship game, May 16th. And we started fall camp, I think uh, August 2nd. It played our next game, our, our opening game against Colorado state, uh, I think September 3rd or 2nd. Uh, you know what? I get asked that a ton. Uh, evidently we set a record with the number of college football games because we were in the playoffs both times yeah. played in one year. Uh, but you know what? I'm a football coach. This is what I love to do. So I'd yep. much rather be coaching football in the spring than going out spring recruiting or spring practice. So our guys embraced it. Our, our coaches embraced it. And we had uh, 
pretty special back-to-back season. Remind me, you got, you had some uh, quarterback injuries towards the end of the first season. So end of May, and you're coming in the beginning of August, playing in September. How did that affect the team? I mean, not only mentally, but or not only physically, but obviously mentally as well, right? I mean, was it probably good and bad? Um, we try to find the good in everything, and I, I don't want to sound like uh, uh, I'm this guy that walks around and everything's beautiful and easy and all, all of that stuff. I just I just been around so many negative coaches uh, that that they, they 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 they're just on their players all the time, and I just don't think that's the way to motivate people. So back to your question. We lost Mark. First of all, we lost our second string quarterback, um, Jabori Gibbs, like in the middle of the season in the spring. Uh, he had a bad knee injury. And then in the in the national championship game in the first drive, first quarter, first drive, we lost our starting quarterback, uh, Mark Gronowski. So both those guys had serious knee injuries that were not coming back in the fall. And I, I would credit Zach Lujan for finding a guy named Chris Oladokun so, so uh, you know, to come in and 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 be a one semester guy, he's a transfer quarterback, and honestly did a phenomenal job. I mean, I've never been. I'm serious. I've never been so amazed at how how a young man comes in, being new, being here in June, and embraced everything and learned everything. And to that point, he played in the NFL Players Association Bowl and ended up being the starting quarterback on his team. So, I mean, he 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 really did a phenomenal job in the fall. So with that, you know, you, you mentioned the uh, two seasons kind of in one calendar year, the most football, just because you're in the playoffs and both of them, most college football games. What else is COVID? How, how, how else has that impacted what a traditional year looks like when it comes to COVID and, and any sort of protocols that you have to follow? Well, in the, in, first of all, in the fall, when it was really, I mean, it was at its peak, really. Uh, we couldn't, we couldn't use our showers. We couldn't use our, our locker room. We had to zoom everything, and so as we were going through the fall and learning football, and really the fall became the spring because we, we didn't have a season. Uh, it was all it was all uh, there were no relationships. I mean, we we had our, our true freshman got there the day before we dropped the season, you know. So they arrive, and then we 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 dropped the season. So I think relationship wise, COVID had a big impact. But when we got into the spring, we had to test our guys once a week. Uh, and this is really cool, man. We we didn't have a one positive test on our football team the whole spring season. So from the start of January to May 16th, not a one positive test in our in our in our players. We had one coach that had a positive test. So talk about a commitment in a college environment. Yeah, talk about incredible. a commitment to, yeah. to the in fact, in fact, the senior goals, the second goal was stay COVID free. And when you <laughs> hear that as a goal, you know. So um you know, it, it, uh, it, our guys embraced it, and, and uh, uh, you know, we have great kids. We have great student-athletes, and they did what we asked them to do. Yeah, like you said, that just shows to your commitment. And, you know, one thing that you kind of touched on is your coaching style is is more of the optimism, opti- you know, being very positive and those kinds of things. And compared to – so what you, when you mentioned other coaches and stuff like that, it's almost kind of like playing, you know, to not get your butt chewed kind of thing, like kind of almost that in fear. You know, uh, here's the way I explain it. Uh, you know, I don't want to have to interview interview every day for my job, right? I don't want to have to. I mean, I'm going to work hard, and if if I'm not working hard, my supervisor has to say, "Hey, Stig, I need more out of you, or I need a better job in this area." But but I want to be. I want to hear or see the positive things I'm doing. I, I don't need that, but I I think that's the way people are wired. And uh, so I learned in here. I'm an educator. I'm a math teacher by trade, and I learned in. In uh, undergraduate class, there's this thing called self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and, and people, how you look at them is how you treat them. Not how you, it starts with how you look at them, how you believe in them. So if I look at you two guys as four-year starters, all Americans, draft picks, I'm going to treat you like that. And it's a choice. And so instead of treating a guy like he hasn't earned his keep, look at him like he's already arrived, correct him when he needs to be corrected, but he will. You know, the, the whole concept is if I look at one kid as a dork and another kid as a genius and, and they're equally skilled, the, the the dork will be held back by my approach and the genius will be raised up by my approach. And it's simply my approach, not their ability. So that's how I approach coaching. Speaking of coaching, coach, uh, let's let's step back a little bit. So you've been around the, the Brookings campus for this would be your 25th year. Is that right? 
25th year as a head coach and, and 34th year as a, as a Jackrabbit. I came as a defensive backs coach, defensive coordinator, and then became the head coach. Well, and not only that, you just signed a contract extension here for two years, a couple of weeks ago. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank so you. your players, I always wondered, you know, I, we watch, I watch all as many games as I can, especially when you guys are on the big networks, you know, you've been on some primetime, I mean, just this past year, multiple games on primetime TV, and you've got these young 19, 20, 21 year old guys, you know, playing ball, you know, they could be from a small school, it can be from a big school. Does that make it even more jittery? Does it, does it make it even more difficult to get the job done when you see those big ESPN trucks on the side and you know it's going to be broadcasted to millions of people? No, it doesn't because every game now, it doesn't matter whether it's ESPN plus or Fox North or whatever it is that that's going to be on TV. I mean, and this happened, I think probably five, six years ago where that became a hundred percent of our season, you know, it used to be, you know, you play, you play and then, okay, this game's going to be a TV game. And so the whole makeup was different because of the commercials. Now sure. we have three commercials every quarter and a commercial yeah. at halftime and, and I always tell the officials they should get paid more because they have to be out here, you know, an extra 25 minutes because of commercials. They don't, yeah, they, they don't get paid more, but uh, uh, I, I don't think it's nervous. Like, like we were, we were prime time. When we played in the national championship game and, and uh, our guys, again, they embrace that and, and the opportunity and they really cherish it. Honestly. Sure. How many kids you got coming back this next year than that was uh, on this heck of a run they had last year. Well, I know more about what we lost. We lost, uh, 12 super seniors, which means guys that got an extra year and they came back for their, their extra year. And then we lost, uh, it would be nine regular seniors that had another year. Like Pierre Strong, our running back is going to be in the NFL combine. He has another year, but, you know, bless his heart, move on and, and go, uh, go take a shot at your dream. So, uh, I don't really know how many starters we have back, but that we lost 21 really good, really good football players, and more importantly, really good leaders. Sure, that's that's tough to overcome. But I mean, in the 25 years you're head coach, you've obviously been down this this same road before many times. You've always made it work. So we'll be watching closest next year. I can't wait for it. Let let, let me add to that. Uh, uh, my wife. <laughs> You know, Zach Zenner was a great running back for us, right? Played in the NFL for five years. Uh, I come home after he graduates. I sit on the couch and I said, we'll never have another running back like Zach Zenner. My wife looked at me. My wife is my head coach, by the way. She looked at me and she said, you know how many times you've said that about a player or a team? So we seem to find the guys that can can uh, uh, fill the spots and play really good football. So speaking of NFL guys, you've had quite a few uh, players, well-known players, play for over the years. And I'm a Sturgis guy. I went to Sturgis Brown High School. So talk to us about Doug Miller. Uh, Doug Miller's uh, – he's one of my favorites. I mean, that that guy was uh, – he was an unbelievable athlete, obviously. I mean, un- unbelievable athlete. But but what a great person. Yeah. And uh, you probably don't know this, but when he, when he ended up uh, ending his NFL career, he came back as a student coach for us. And so here's wow. this guy that's sitting around in the coaching and, and he was getting a salary because he, because he had been injured. And so he was the highest paid coach on our staff. <laughs> He's getting paid more than me. And he was a student coach and just a, just a great young man and great athlete. And uh, I'll never forget when, when it was time for him to get drafted and, and you know, he had that long hair, you remember him and, and he cut his hair to, to make a better impression and stuff. And I said to his mom, I said, he looks good, right? And she said, no, I liked his long hair. <laughs> so uh, I, I said, I didn't say all the right things, but uh, great athlete, great friend of the program, and one of the tougher funerals I've ever been to uh, when he passed away. Yeah, it was a tragedy. There's a, you know, in Sturgis, up the, one of the local restaurants, popular restaurants, I, I should say, there's a little memorial set up for him. And even in the old the Sturgis Brown High School, I went to school, there's a there's a memorial set up for him as well. So yeah, he definitely impacted the community and uh, it's a shame what happened. Yeah. It's such a very unexpected, unfortunate kind of circumstance around that, which is pretty just crazy to think about. What other players we got Dallas Goddard, we got Vinatieri. You've had some, some local South Dakota proud guys that have gone, you know, far up. Do you, do you keep in contact with any of those folks then, or are they so busy and you're so busy? It just doesn't work out very often other than maybe a, Happy birthday or Merry Christmas text every now and then. 
Uh, I try to send them a, a note on their birthday. Um, we send them some SDSU gear, and I add a note to that every fall. You know, just think about Adam Vinatieri and walking out of his house, going to buy a car, uh, going to Walmart. That guy, is, that guy cannot be undercover, right? So yeah. he doesn't need another guy from long distance bugging him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I just try to be a cheerleader for him. Uh, some of the, you know, we talked about Doug Miller. Uh, Adam Timmerman and a- Adam Vinatieri played in the same era. Both played against each other. They played against each other in the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, what a great career Adam Adam uh, Vinatieri had. Uh, Dallas Goddard, uh, we played in Villanova, which is in Philadelphia. He plays for the Eagles. He he was on our sideline, talked to our team at the end of the game. Yep. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal young man. Uh, Brian Witzman played a bunch of years. Zenner we talked about. Right now, Kristen Roseboom is a backup linebacker, special teams guy for – for the Rams, he's playing the Super Bowl. What a dream come true! So uh, you, you just cheer. You cheer for those guys is what you do. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of the Super Bowl, we'll get into this a little bit later on here. But do you have a what's what's? Do you have a favorite NFL team? You're from Selby, <laughs> so I assume maybe Vikings fan. I don't follow the NFL. I follow our players that play in the NFL. I spend. Uh, 70 to 90 hours on football every week during the season. It's my, I'm wired like this. If I come home and I've got a free time, I got some free time and I don't spend it with my wife. I, I spend it on NFL football and shame on me, you know? And sure. so my priorities are my faith, my family, and then football. And I can't, I can't, there's no time for the NFL. Do I have a favorite? Uh, it's gotta be the Rams because of Christian Rose boom. Normally sure. I go with the underdog, which, which would be, uh, the other team, but but uh, I got to root for my guy, and and hopefully he he experiences uh, truly a dream come true. So, coach, we talked about you know crazy last year was an anomaly, right? The, the throw that out, but in your twenty four so far twenty four seasons as a head coach, how much of this? I mean, you work obviously year round. You're probably way busier for the the playing part of the year versus the other year, but I'm sure you're busy all the time. How much of the year are you are you able to stay put and just work on different things versus you're traveling, constantly traveling, constantly recruiting? Is it a small percentage of the year, like a month or two, or are you, or is it a little bit more laid back than I'm making it sound? Um, we work hard. Our, our assistant coaches work a lot harder than I do, work longer hours than I do. But I tell you what, in answer to your question, the NCA has created some rules. Uh, in the last number of years that has made it a lot better. Like I used to, when we were division two, uh, you know, the, the season would end, we weren't in the playoffs. We'd start recruiting. We'd celebrate Christmas. I'd pack the family up, go to Minneapolis, put them in a hotel and go watch basketball tournaments of guys we were recruiting. That's a dead period. Now, now, now uh, after the signing date in December, that's dead until after the convention coaches convention, which is the second week of, of January. So that's really made it a better, more palatable deal. And then kids make student athletes make decisions so much earlier. I hadn't been in a home visit for three years. I went, we went to Colorado. I was in three homes out there, but I mean, they're, they're deciding before their senior year. So they don't need to see me in January sitting in their home, you know, uh, so on. So, but it's different. So you're watching film, you're, you're looking at cutups, you're, you're doing things. Uh, I say it this way, guys, uh, when I get to work eight to five and go home, I feel like I'm on vacation, right? That, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's not a hard day's work for a football coach. So, and then unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, because of my title, because of our success, I get asked to speak at a lot of events. They don't, they don't realize I'm not a very good public speaker, but they think <laughs> because I'm the head football coach, uh, I'm worthy of, uh, of being asked and and uh, I, I straighten that out real quick when I start my talk. That's also, <laughs> and in my opinion, that's a blessing to be asked. You mentioned that you got assistant coaches. So you're on, you surround yourself with people that you have to trust because there's so much that to, to make a program work where it's, it's not just, just you coach, it, it goes down to, to, to your staff and all those things. How do you surround yourself with people that you, you trust? What, what does that process look like? How much is really on them? you know, from a, you know, coordinator standpoint and all those things, because the coaching staff is, is huge. I mean, that's, it, it, you're, it starts with you, but then it trickles down. What does that look like? Yeah, th- this is a, this, the really good question. 
and something people a lot of people don't understand. First of all, when they give the coach of the year award, it should ne- in football it should never be the coach of the year. It should be the coaching staff of the year. When I mean, you have a head coach and ten assistants, how can you say this guy's worthy of this award? So, and I've been blessed in the in the conference to win that a couple of times, and so I always tried to deflect it to the assistants. Uh, uh, interesting question because we have three openings right now, right? And we've got a safeties position open, a wide receivers position open, a tight ends position open, and opening. And uh, these guys are, are are crucial. And so here's what I look at, look for, and and I, I I don't I don't waver from this. And this is what my dad taught me on the farm in Selby, South Dakota. He, he taught me to be a good person, all right, a man of character. So if, I, if we're going to go out recruiting. And I'm going to trust you to, uh, to, to do things right because there's a lot of people that don't follow the rules. I want to have a guy with moral character, with a, a moral foundation. It, it work hard. You know, what does that mean? Uh, we know you, when you end a day and you know you worked hard, you know it. And you know when you didn't work hard. And so be a person that rejoices in working hard. And then the last thing to tie a couple things together, which my dad didn't teach me, but I think is really important, is to be a good teacher. All right. You know, if you're a man of character, you're going to treat people right. You're going to do things right. If you if you work hard, you're going to get everything out of your ability. But there are so many coaches, so many football coaches that were good football players, but they don't know how to teach the sport, all right? And they don't understand. They, they can't comprehend how the kid just doesn't understand what I'm talking about when I teach cover four because you got to break it down. And so when a guy comes in for an interview, it is a grueling interview and then they have to teach us like we're freshmen. And I really pay a lot of attention to that. So, uh, and then, and then just build, build a relationship with those guys. I, I don't get to coach a position. So I get to coach our 10, 10 assistants. And so they need to be an extension of what I believe in. That, that's awesome. The continuity and stuff like that, that you have coach. That's awesome. Sidebar question. Okay. So I know we're talking a lot of football and stuff like that, but there's one thing cause we're, we're digging into, you know, making sure that we knew, you know, good questions to ask you and those kinds of things, coach. And and one that really kind of caught my eye, like I said, not football related, but was your Twitter handle at Holy Nutmeg. Where did that come from? Well, first of all, if if somebody has said, if, if nobody would have said, you've got to be on Twitter, I would not be on Twitter, right? <laughs> that was not my choice. So five, six years ago, maybe even a little, little bit longer, uh, this guy over in our, our administration said, you got to get on Twitter. So people can follow you. I had no idea what he's talking about. Okay. Um, and so he comes over to set up my phone and he said, what do you want it to be? I said, I don't, I don't care. And uh, in my office, there's a sign that says holy nutmeg. Right. So he said, let's use that. So, it, so that's, so where did holy nutmeg come from? And I'll be, I'll be, I'll be as honest as, as I'll be honest. Right. I go visit coaching staffs, right. As a young coach, I go visit coaching staffs. I go watch practice. And and I'm not kidding. It's like if you're a football coach, you have to insert the F word every other sentence. You understand what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. It's like it's like if I say the F word, I motivate my defensive tackles. I motivate my running backs. And I stood out there year after year, day after day. And I thought, this is embarrassing. My name is coach. His name is coach. And they're going to they're going to compare us. They're going to say that's why all coaches are. And so, number one. I expect our coaches not to use profanity, any profanity on our football field. So if you came and watched practice, you would not hear that. And if a player uses a profanity, especially the F word, I kick him off the field because I think it's a sign of weakness because we choose our words. So why holy nutmeg? That's my, that's my word that says we've reached a point, man. Either I'm really excited <laughs> or I'm really disappointed about holy nutmeg. What are we doing here? And so I know a long, long answer to that, but, uh, uh, they know for me, my F word is holy nutmeg. Okay. Leave it at that. <laughs> gotcha. No, that's awesome. That's that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I never would have guessed that, but I can see it. Like it's, that's, that's classic. <laughs> so if we go back to, to, you mentioned him earlier, Pierre strong, right? He's, he's going, he's getting going for the draft, uh, going to the combine and, and, you know, I put a letter out, I think just just not too long ago saying that he was going to do that. How does that as a, as a coach, when you see them leave, you know, with a year of eligibility left, maybe they go on their junior year, you know, what is that? What's your reaction to something like that? 
Well, you know, the, he's leaving with a COVID year. So he's he's been here five. So he's just leaving with that extra COVID year, which is a whole different topic that we have to deal with uh, for the next four years. But um, first of all, when our when our seniors leave, it's hard on me. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm we have a family here. And I, I love these guys. I'm not kidding. Ninety eight percent of the texts I send to the team, I end it with love you, Coach Stig. All right. Because I mean it. I want I want to feel that. Uh, we've never had a guy leave early, truly early. Dallas Goddard, we had pro scouts up the yin yang when Dallas Goddard was a junior. And, and one of the guys said, is he going to leave early? Is he going to come out early? I didn't know what he's talking about. I said, I said, what are you talking about? He said, he's going to enter the draft early. I said, I hope not, you know, cause we've never had that. But when I, when a young man, I mean, we had three guys in that NFL PA bowl here's in the East West. When those guys get that opportunity, you just have to. Isn't life about pursuing your dream, man? I mean, that's that's life, and so few of us do that. And these guys are on the the cusp of doing that. I, I just I just feel so fortunate to be around people like that. So uh, I love Pierre. Uh, Pierre came into my office. This will be intimate here. Pierre came into my office towards the end of the season, and he said, "What if I come back?" for my extra year. And I said, why would you come back, Pierre? He said, because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. I don't know how to, he said, I've never been around somebody that didn't live paycheck to paycheck. He said, I've never been, and maybe that's too intimate, but he, he was concerned about not being mentored enough to go out in the real world. And we hear these stories, right? Yeah. You guys get all this money and they don't yeah. have any left yeah. because they, they don't have an example. It doesn't make them a bad person. They just don't, they had an example, and I said, "Pierre, we'll take care of you. We'll do everything we can. We'll, but uh, you need you need to go and 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 really, what he was doing is dropping his guard and saying, Coach, uh, I'm cool, I'm tough, I'm all that, but I also have some needs inside sure. me that that uh, it, it was one of the cooler moments as a head coach. Yeah. That being vulnerable, like you said, you know, and and being able to have that conversation with you, and yeah, that's crazy to think about, you know, and you look at his stats for this year, and you just think like he's gonna." I would, I don't know, be a fairly high draft pick, but I guess we'll see, you know, it'll be interesting to see just to be able to watch the draft and hopefully see him get called out being SDSU. And we're from, you know, South Dakota, that, 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 that's amazing stuff. Dallas Goddard. I think if I recall, he dropped, I, I don't remember where he was at, but it was close where the Cowboys had an opportunity to draft him and I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. Um, and so, you know, that, that would have had a, you know, now that he's an Eagles fan, now it's a competitor, you know, but seeing him do well, do great things and coming from South Dakota state university, of course, is huge. So it's awesome to see him. I think he, being a pro bowl, I think he ended up injured this year, I think, but I mean, it's good stuff to see. So that's got, as a coach, it's got to make you proud. Very proud. Let, let me go on record so that uh, I can't continue to be uh, transparent. Dallas Goddard was a non-scholarship guy for us. All right. <laughs> He is a third round draft pick or second round, whatever he was. He was a non scholarship guy. Now, num num number one, great job by Dallas Goddard. Number two, I'm not so sure how, how smart our football staff is <laughs> that we have a guy that ends up being a all, all pro type guy and we ask him to walk on for us. But uh, those stories are fun to talk about. Is that, coach, is that particular story like the most amazing success story you have or, for a player over the years? Uh, walk on kid and he ends up being one of the premier tight ends in the NFL. Uh, without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. I, I, first of all, we didn't know anything about him. He's from Britain, South Dakota. And I had a guy that coached with us, a guy named Carl Larson, who ended up leaving the coaching and going into the ministry. And he was a it was Lutheran pastor in Millbank helping coach. So that tying the dot, everything together He's coaching against Dallas Goddard. He calls up one day and goes, hey, this is this kid in, in uh, Britain you got to look at. So I watch his film, and I can't find any. I, it's just the, the quality of the film is, is not very good. So I go watch him play basketball, and here's this biggest guy in the court shooting three-point shots <laughs> and not following the shot. And so I called him up, and I said, Dallas, I don't, <laughs> I don't think you can make it here. I don't think you work hard enough. He said, we'll see, coach. And I think he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder because of that conversation, but uh, I'm really proud of Dallas Goddard. Oh, it's incredible. You know, here's another cool, here's another cool story. I don't know if you saw his contract he signed, but he signed this mega contract. And the guy that coached him here at South Dakota State asked him, 
what he spent his what, what did he spend his first money on after he signed his contract, and he said nothing yet. <laughs> so the money, the money has not changed that uh, small town South Dakota guy. That's awesome, man. That's cool. That's, ah, can you not root for him? Okay, he's the Eagles. I still root for him. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, I mean we're we're South Dakota proud, right? We're all three nope. of us are are uh, born and bred legitimate South Dakota folks. And you know, Coach, you've had a lot of South Dakota players on the team, and you know, welcome the out of state guys. Of course, you guys are a super competitive program. So of course, you're gonna have. You know, folks coming from Texas and Colorado, like you said, but um, what's some of the most memorable games or maybe even game situations you've had? I know watching you for years and years on TV, uh, you know, all the games, there's a couple that, you know, stick out in my head. But as a coach on the sidelines, you can hear things we can't hear. You're seeing things we can't see. You know, background stories that maybe the, the general fans don't know. What's something that sticks out to you? Uh, there's, uh, you know, I, I, I get asked the question, what's my greatest victory? Let me answer that first. Okay. My greatest victory is when I'm sitting in my office and down the hallway walks a guy that played here 10 years ago. And he's got this beautiful wife and two beautiful children. And they sit in my office and they talk about, he talks about his life and how his experience at South Dakota state, South Dakota state football impacted him. That is an unbelievable feeling. And I get to do that because I've been here so long. You know, if I've been here three years, five years in another institution, that wouldn't happen. And so uh, that's, those are my greatest victories. Uh, in terms of memorable games, we played St. Cloud on Hobo Day years ago. We were Division II, North Central Conference. And uh, I think it was Andy Rennerfeld threw a Hail Mary to, I think, Brock Barron. He caught the ball in the end zone. And we won the game at the end of the game. But that was cool. And, and But at the end of the game, this is my, uh, my, my, the, the part that no one gets. I'm kneeling on the sidelines, kind of praying and just being excited. And my brother, who jumped the jumped the, the railing, jumped onto the field and came out and tackled me, was laying on top of me, cheering. And, and my brother's deceased now. So it's 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 a really special memory. Uh and then I'll be honestly, uh the Colorado State game last year was unbelievable environment, unbelievable yeah. performance by the Jackrabbits. So yeah. I mean it was it was kind of like like uh, everything just, you know, for the first game, new quarterback, all that stuff. Uh, those those are special. But they're all special, really. I, I'm i blessed to be a coach. I swear after the Colorado game out here in the Black Hills where we're from, you've seen a few more Jackrabbits, you know, uh, hoodies and stickers on cars. And, heck, I'll tell you right now in Rapid, we have the Black Hills Stock Show and Rodeo, which is the second largest event in the state. And uh, I'm, I'm working the booth there for my company and I swear to God, you can't go 10 minutes without seeing a Jackrabbit something, you know, like a the, like what you're wearing, a blue pullover or something. So it's pretty amazing how that program has just stretched. Like, I don't know how often you got to West River. You know, I don't we don't have a whole lot of kids going to your program. I know from Rapid City in this area, but there's it's just there's a ton of fans out here. It's, it's a it's a big deal. It's pretty awesome to see you here. It's, uh, you know, we, we you know the national championship game in May uh, put us on the map some. Uh ESPN game day being here 2019 yeah. had a huge impact that was on huge. South Dakota state. I mean, you, you can't buy that kind of advertising. Yeah. You can't afford it. 13 FCS programs have ever had game day part of that. And that was against the, what North Dakota state bison, yep. wasn't it? Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah. It was a, it was a, and, and thank goodness, you know, a side story there, uh, a coach that was at Wyoming that had been part of North Dakota state's uh, staffs called us up out of the blue and said, Hey, let your players be part of this. Cause at North Dakota state, the first time we went up there, they, they didn't let their players be part of it. And it was really a mistake. So a credit to that coach called up and said, and so we, we allowed our guys to be part of some of it. And it, it made a bigger memory because of that. The bars were packed that day. I remember that really well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you dusty go figure. I remember the first half, <laughs> not a loaded question by any means. But you mentioned it earlier, right? You have the opportunity where these these players of yours come back and they're able to visit with you and they have family because you've been here for an extensive period of time, right? With as a jackrabbit, either as a head coach or as an assistant coach. What's keeping you here, coach? Um, <laughs> uh, the priorities my wife and I have, you know, again, uh, our faith. Uh, we got the job because I was offered a head coaching job in Division Three. 
uh, while this was open before I got it. And they made me decide, they asked me to decide before the decision here was made, before the interviews were done. And we just got on our knees and, and uh, asked for direction. And, and uh, uh, this is the place we were supposed to be. Uh, number two, our kids were able to go to the same elementary schools, high school, uh, all those types of things, which if you look at coaching resumes, that, that's what generates your question, right? I mean, it's three years here, it's two years here, it's yep. uh, whatever. And then, and then uh, I don't want to sound too simple, but uh, when the rumors are going around about the Michigan State coach this year getting a 10-year contract for $95 million, uh, I told my wife that. I'll never forget these things. We were sitting on the couch, and I told my wife that, and she looked at me and she said, don't we get paid a lot of money? <laughs> and I said, not quite that amount, but yeah, we do. <laughs> and uh, uh, so just again, uh, South Dakota state's been good to us and we want to be good to South Dakota state. You got at least two more years so we can all kind of sigh uh, and relief, you know, that we can know that the, the folks will be around you and you're always working on getting new coaches. You got two new coordinators this year, right? Did, did do I got that right? Your coordinators got promoted. We do. We lost. Uh, we've lost three coaches. Two of the coordinators became head coaches. Jay Snack is the head coach at Idaho, and and uh, Brian Berkstrom's the head coach at Winona State. So we elevated guys within. So when when that like you know that's like is it kind of how the NFL is? You have all these rumors around. I mean, maybe not as much social media attention. Um, the FCS gets as NFL, but there's still a lot of people that write stories about you folks. Do you kind of know ahead of time that's going to happen because of the quality work they do and you got to kind of move on just like how when you lose a, a a kid to, you know, when he's a senior or he moves up, you know, in early draft. I know you haven't had that very often with Dallas it was the only exception, but you, you kind of know it's coming. So you, you, you kind of putting feelers out there for folks. You know, uh, we talked about this today as a staff. Uh, we, we do, we do, Uh, get feelers out, we get news out, but I really want to be very objective when it comes to the people that apply for our jobs. I don't like it when, you know, you've got this list of 60 guys and somebody comes in and says, I really like these two. I'm thinking we haven't interviewed them. You know, what, what, uh, how can we, how how can we know they're a good person, work hard and they're great teachers of football. Uh, So I, I try to not get emotional about the whole thing and, and let let it play the the, the system out. Uh, I love interviews. I love uh, the opportunity to better our program, right? And here here's my analogy: When I retire, Justin Sell, our athletic director, is charged with bringing in a better coach than I was, right? So when Jason Eck left, Brian Bergstrom left, Luke Fleischer left, my charge is to bring in a better coach than they were. Were they bad coaches? No, they're unbelievable coaches. Well, what's the charge? Zach Zenner yeah. leaves. We got to bring in a better, and that's just that's the nature of the business. There's no status quo uh, in athletics. You got to you got to get better. Sure, you need to progress. That's awesome. Can I insert some here? Yeah. As I look at your guys' name, uh, I had two brothers. Right, my oldest brother was Jim. My youngest brother was Jerry, and and John. And and uh, my mother would introduce us like this. As I look at your names, your, your title, she would say, this is Jim, our oldest. This is John. He wears husky pants. And this is Jerry, the youngest. And, and she was dead serious. She was making, she was, she was trying to define that this fat, that, you know. And so I, I keep smiling as I look at you guys' title because if you go to J.C. Penney's, they still have husky pants for little boys. <laughs> Oh, we were husky kids, and now we're husky adults. Big and, and tall uh, section. What's up? <laughs> well, we are the Chesky boys, and uh, that that you know, as a matter of fact, Joe, let's just kick this off. So, so, coach, we got a serious question for you. Maybe the most serious question of the night. Um, if you're not chubby, you're not husky. What could you be, coach? What would you be? What's a hybrid of those two? It's got to be Chusky, right? It's got to be yeah, Chusky. That's right. That's yeah. right. If it ain't Chusky, it ain't right. That's right. <laughs> Keep it Chusky. Speaking of that, off the top of my head, so football, I mean, football head coach, you you know, the the one of the power teams in the FCS, you know, one of the, the premier teams to be at. You've got some big boys playing on that team. How much of those kids really eat, those, those 20-year-old linemen? It is gross. It's gross <laughs> what they eat. When we, when we go on the road, 
<laughs> you know, and they, we have these really nice buffets and they pile that plate, you know, <laughs> so it's essentially dropping off the side and they go back for seconds. I think, how can you do that to your body? But uh, they eat a lot. And uh, we have two fueling stations in our, in our facility. We make cold meat sandwiches, boiled eggs, granola bars, fruit and all that stuff. And it disappears most of the time pretty fast. Uh, wow. But they, they, you know, Aaron Johnson, our, our left tackle, came here at 240 pounds. He played in that uh, NFL PA Bowl. He made himself, uh, uh, that, I mean, he had to eat his tail off or tail on, I should say, to be able to have a chance to, to play at our level. And credit to him, uh, he did it. And, and uh, now he's got a chance to maybe play in the NFL. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, it's just eating is one thing, but then going to eat and then going like the, so the traveling, right? So how grueling is your travel? Because you had to you eat all this food and you had to stay big and hydrated, obviously, you know, because you're playing so much, you're practicing playing games. Then you get to travel. And I know, I don't know about you guys. Like if I travel to like fly out to California, I'm like dead for 12 hours. I'm just completely exhausted. I don't know what it is. Like, do you guys experience that a lot? Is it overcome it with coffee and Red Bull? Are these young 20-year-old guys, <laughs> they they don't have that problem? Or how, how does that work? Um, well, first of all, the, the longest road trip we make on a bus is five hours to, to Northern Iowa, the University of Northern Iowa. So that's not bad. Uh, so we, 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 pra- we I'll give you an example. Friday, we'll practice in the morning in, in, in our indoor They'll, they'll come out of practice, they'll shower, they'll have a sandwich waiting for them, uh, chips, fruit, uh, power aids, get on the bus, uh, get, to the, get to the plane, we, we charter, so we're not going commercial, so we're, gonna, we're renting the plane, we're flying out, flying back, there's a snack bag, so they can grab more, more uh, hydration stuff and all the snack stuff they need. Uh, depending on the time schedule, we may land and they may have another s- sandwich uh, for them. And then we'll have uh, an unbelievable buffet. Uh, and then at night, we call it Stig Pop. They'll come <laughs> to my room in the hotel and we'll have Powerade water. Uh, or get, uh, Powerade, yeah, Powerade water. And then we'll have fruit and Uncrustables and, and uh, uh, all these snack type things. So they eat constantly, really. Yeah. So um, th- is the travel exhausting? No, because we charter. We get on the plane, we fly back. You know, it's really... It's we're, we're spoiled is what we are, to be honest. Sure. Yeah. Has that always been the situation then while you're a head coach or has it really changed with the FCS or has it, has it always, I assume back in the day, you probably didn't have those luxuries because you had a different conference. I mean, you played different teams and that's what we didn't, we didn't touch on that yet, but you know, with the FCS schedule, it's probably a little bit more grueling than what you're used to. I assume not only the talent of the schools that you're playing, the programs you're playing, but it's, it's more of a, is it spread out throughout the country a bit more, isn't it? It is. Uh, you know, history lesson would be when I became the head coach, we were division two and we played in the North central conference. So it was up and down uh, I 29, you know, you had Augie, you had Morningside, you had uh, Nebraska, Omaha, you had Mankato, you had St. Cloud, the, the North Dakota schools. And then the oddball was Northern Colorado. And we, we always, we would fly there, but we'd go commercial. And so oh, you'd, sure. you'd have to be at the mercy of, getting out there, getting all your guys, all the plane tickets and so on. When we went at the FCS, our first season, man, FCS, uh, we had seven away games out of 11 games and they were all plane flights. And so we were going to Louisiana. We were going to Oregon. We were going to Cal Poly, California. We were going all over the place. And so, and those were all commercial in those days. Yeah. And so that was uh, for our travel guy. I'm sure it, drove them out of coaching. I don't even remember who it was, but uh, now it's charter. Now it's easy. Now it's, so it has, there's been an evolution of, of how to run this thing and how to do it right. And uh, so we'll, you know, we, we open with, with Iowa. That's a, that's a close enough game that we'll bust down there. There we'll probably get a guarantee of, I don't know, a half a million dollars, 600,000. And, and we'll put that in the kitty, not our kitty, but the kitty to be able to buy other people to come to our place. So we aren't traveling as much. So yeah. our, our administration has a great philosophy on taking that guarantee and getting us an extra home game. So ideally we have six out of the 11 games, uh, our, our, our home games. Crazy. Never, never thought about that. You know, all the stuff that goes into it, the, you know, college program, it's not just what you put on the fields. How do you get there? How do you bring people to your stadium? It's crazy. 
How many people travel total to like a, to a game if you, if you charter a flight? Our whole coaching staff. Uh, if if it's a if it's a if it's a non conference game like Colorado State, there's no limits, right? So we took seventy guys to Colorado State uh, in in the in our conference and in the uh, the all but the finals of the playoffs. It's sixty four guys. So we take sixty four guys. We may have a situation like this, man. We may have a an offensive lineman that. You know, we don't know if he's going to play until game time. We'll take 65. We'll warm up 65. And then somebody's going to take their jersey off and stand on the sidelines. Um, and then we have our whole coaching staff, obviously, all our all our uh, support staff with equipment, athletic training, uh, probably up to uh, close to 100 guys, 100 people. Oh. We'll travel. You know, we, big... we have a we have a bunch of student coaches. That's my that's my history. I was a student coach. I didn't play in college, so I got my start as a student coach at South Dakota State. So I, my my heart goes out to those guys. I love to take those guys along on trips. That's awesome. That's awesome, Coach. You got a you got a heck of a program there. I mean, we're just in awe of it, and uh, and you allowing you know just a snippet of some time this evening on on a on on a day where you're signing players or you know signing students. Um, have you ever had the one last question that I have coach is, is have you had, do you run into it a lot where you do have people who commit to South Dakota state and then they end up flipping to, to, to a different school or do you not run into that issue? Well, two things, two different, totally different things. Uh, number one, I'm honored to be on your podcast, right? I am. I have no friends as a head coach. So if somebody asks me to, to talk, I, 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 it makes me feel good. So I appreciate you guys. All right. Thank you coach. Uh, do we have guys that flip? We had a linebacker uh, go back to this early signing day. We had a linebacker that committed to us, really good football player, ended up getting an offer from Minnesota. He's from Minnesota. He, he decommitted. We had a young man from Minnesota defensive end that had committed, uh, got offered by Iowa State. He decommitted. Um, I expect him to do that. You know, again, I'm. we talked about pursue your dream. Uh, you know, that, that's a, a higher level dream than than we are uh two good programs also uh but not very often you know we recruit guys with you know really solid foundations and and so it'd be awkward for them to to decommit just to decommit so sure um, not very often and that kind of goes to my last question too i didn't ask earlier and it kind of ties into this so you guys being the powerhouse that you are in the fcs let's call it like it is i mean you guys have had great great success does that make it does that make it? Uh, I don't. I don't want to say easier, but does it make it more attainable to attract these talented athletes to come to your school? It's got to help out, right? It does. Yeah, it does. Uh, I'll give you mo- the most recent example. So we, we talked about this earlier. We lose our quarterback in the in the first quarter, the first series of the national championship game. Right? We're on national TV. Uh, our quarterback coach Zach Luhan is scouring the nation. Cause we got to get a guy. We're, we're, we're down our top two. We got to get a guy. He finds Chris Oladokun. He calls up his quarterback coach. Cause he's got a, he's got a connection with him. The quarterback is coaching. He's working with Chris at the time on some drills, right? You follow <laughs> my story. Yeah. So he, he, so he calls him and the quarterback coach goes, Chris, are you interested in South Dakota state? And and he goes, is that the team I just watched in the national championship game? You bet, <laughs> you know. And so the success, the exposure, the the you still have to work hard. You still have to get to know the the kid, and they got to get to know you. But um, it surely helped. It, it's it's our best business card, right? Sure. Our, our record and our, our our success. One last thing I got for you, coach. And I know it's getting late there. You're Easter over time. What, uh, you know, as long as you've been around that program quite a while, um, do, do you have, is there a, a, an absolute hardcore fan base? I know there is, but are there people that you know you're going to see out there every game, no matter how cold or how hot it is outside, or no matter, you know, they're not young people maybe anymore. They've been around for a long time. Do you have any, any folks that really stick out to you that when one day you hang it up and you're not going to coach anymore, you'll really miss them as well as the players? Yeah, there are, there are so many of them, that, and and because of football, because you, I think we averaged fourteen thousand. You know, we don't have fourteen thousand hardcore fans, but uh, I would guess for football we have three, four thousand. And then there are people that are at every event, right? 
They're at every basketball game, every football game, every wrestling meet. They just bleed uh, South Dakota State athletics. And those people, I, 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 I liken them to like maybe being part of a cult where they don't feel they have a choice. They just, they just, they have to go because of the, the draw. But uh, that's what we all want, right? We want that type of following. Yeah, yeah. One last one I got written down here too. Uh, so we talked about Adam Vinatieri. His kiddo just signed to play football here this past couple of days ago. Did he look at, was he, was he on the radar of you guys at all? Or is that something you can't really discuss? Yeah, I can. Yeah. We, we recruited him. He came on an official visit. Uh, we offered him, uh, you know, he got offered by UMass. They spent a bunch of time, in New England. So it's kind of like going home really. Yeah. It's FBS, not FCS. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for AJ and, and, and Adam and, what a cool deal for Adam, right? To Absolutely, be able to see yeah. his son kick in college and, and yeah. close to where he spent a lot of special years. So uh, I tell those guys this, you know, our job is to help them make a decision. And I, and I, I want you to hear me on this because uh, so many coaches try to talk young men into decisions. I, I have zero interest in that. I want, I want to help guys make a decision. I want to be transparent. If South Dakota State's not the place, then I rejoice in it. You know, sure. we, there's – there's three South Dakota kids up in North Dakota State's team that I look up after every game and talk to them because I got to know them during recruiting and I want to know how they're doing. I don't hold a grudge. You know, it's their job to make the decision. It's my job to, to be transparent. That's great stuff. Thanks for taking us and uh, taking us what it's like to be a, a, a coach in the FCS. Not a not an easy 40 hour a week job. Uh, JR and I, we've also uh, we've been working pretty hard with work health care with this COVID situation, but it's it's, we still get to get home every night, and then you do a lot of a lot of time away from home and away from your wife. And are your are your you have it sounds like you have kids there. Are they around the area then, or we have a son and daughter in law and a grandson in town. We have a daughter and a, a son in law and three grandkids in uh, in uh, Mason City, Iowa. We have a son in Minneapolis and a daughter in Sioux Falls. So they're all within striking distance and get home for the holidays. They get home for the holidays. Uh, unfortunately, uh, football has been so much of our life that they feel like they got to travel to Colorado State or Frisco or whatever. And and uh, and I love that, but but I I don't want that to be a priority. I want family to be a priority. And and but it's really honoring, uh, you know, our daughter, son-in-law, and three grandkids, and our son drove to Frisco wow. in, in May, and and the the younger child was under two so the commitment is is great uh yeah. but they're they're great they're unbelievable uh, fans and kids so it's family football and dusty i just want to go back a little bit you mentioned 40 hour work week coach did say it was like 80 90 hour work weeks okay no, no so, i meant us yeah, okay. a 40 yeah, hour okay all right us. all right all right i just want to call that out. i'm like <laughs> i'm like hey, i'm like in my 40 you 45 guys, hours here <laughs> are you are you both from the hills area yeah yes, sir. yeah you guys need to make a road trip out and we'll have you guys stand on the sidelines and get a taste for what it means to be a, a jackrabbit. And I'll let you guys call the fourth down plays, okay? <laughs> I'm there, man. We're taking you up on that I'm, road trip. <laughs> yeah, I got your cell phone number. I'm not going to forget that. I'm there, man. I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious as a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coach, how can we? Uh, how can our tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands subscribers, how can they follow you? We, we talked about the Twitter handle at Holy Nutmeg. Is that your only social media that you use? That is. I, I think the best account is uh, the SDSU football one. Yep. Because that's they, they, they put a lot more uh, product out, if you will. Um, I'm a reactive uh, social media guy, not a proactive guy. So uh, I, I need my recruiting coordinator to come down and say, hey, will you please tweet this out? And then I do it. So <laughs> Here's my phone. Make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Coach, we need your phone. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's awesome. And that 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 Twitter account is at GoJacksFB on Twitter. So, Coach, anything else you want to end with? Like I said, once again, we appreciate your time and, and everything, and 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 how you, you know just how you coach and stuff like that. You're you're definitely an amazing individual, and and I know that from visiting with you for the last hour. So I'm I'm really fortunate that uh, that you joined and and, and came and, and visited with us. Thank you. I, I would I would finish with this. Uh, and and I know I'm I'm biased. I know I'm brainwashed, but I really think FBS or F FCS 
football is the best level. Uh, it's it's guys guys are still student athletes. I mean, our guys graduate. Our guys are pharmacists and engineers and teachers and so on. They they do pursue the dream to be at the in the NFL, but they don't come here with that intention. Uh, it's a great level of football. We play in the toughest conference. FCS conference in America and the Missouri Valley football conference. So I'm not trying to sell tickets here, but I do think it, it, for the purity of the game and the level of competition, FCS football is, is a great, great level. And I'm blessed to be part of it. I absolutely agree. I think it's a perfect conference for, for uh, the Midwest folks out here. I think it's uh, the, the kids blend in. Well, you never hear terrible stories. You know, it's just always uh, great athletes uh, great schools, great students, and and they put on a heck of a game every weekend. So we really appreciate you doing what you do, and we love watching you, man. We can't wait till it comes back around in the fall. Well, I can't wait also. Coach Stig, we Chesky boys are going to sign off. Thanks so much again. Um, we will be in touch. We will be at a game. Can I bring a plus one with me? I got a big yes. – Big Jack Rabbit football fan. I'm actually in his house right now. He used in his I have a three year olds and two dogs. My house is always chaos. So I come across the street and use his home for uh, my podcast station. So we'll have a couple of us road trip out there. Absolutely. Do you ever get out to Rapid City at all for anything? Uh, I'm coming out there in April, I think, for a prayer breakfast type of deal. I think, oh, I think it's in April. So yeah, uh, not very often. You know, we just. Uh, again, the way recruiting works, you don't you don't leave the I don't leave the office much. To be honest sure. So yeah. Well, when whenever there is a time where you're you're not coaching anymore, maybe a step back in a different role. Who knows what the future holds? You know, years and years down the road, do you ever see yourself having a cabin out here or anything like that? My wife and my wife and I have talked about that a bunch. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, based on my job. Uh, it a uh, peace and quiet is good sometimes. Really Absolutely. good. So yeah, you bet. Coach Stigemeyer, head coach for the South Dakota State University Jackrabbits football team. Thanks so much for being on the Chesky Boys. You uh, you may not be Chesky, but I feel like you embody the Chesky Boys values, and we really appreciate that. <laughs> and yeah. when you were younger, the Husky pants. And, and the Husky pants. Once, <laughs> once Chesky, always Chesky. Yeah, Chesky well, at heart. I look forward to meeting you guys in person this fall, okay? Thanks, Coach. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks, Coach. Right. Have a good night. God bless. Thanks. Dusty, outdone yourself. Big night. Great interview with Coach Stigemeyer. That was Chusky Boy worthy right there. That was absolutely that was, Ab- at bar none, dude. I like, thought it was just... going to be intense, but I mean, Coach is he's just so dang nice and he is. And, and thoughtful. And, like, absolutely. I don't know what it is. Like, I want to start running laps and go walk on for his program at 37 years old and play uh, offensive tackle for him. You know what I mean? Like just yeah. that, that kind of an awesome individual. That was, that was amazing, dude. I want to be the star quarterback in uh, Dusty, at 38 I mean, uh, years old. It ain't, I'm, well, you, you, you know, where you got me is running laps. I'm like, Oh no, nothing. <laughs> not, not there boys. Hard pass. But he's talking about some of the buffet line stuff. Like, you know, boy, we going to get down. Like, get how down. Much, like do those kids got to pay for them buffet plates. I assume, <laughs> The program covers that. Dude, that's just an awesome. awesome program. And dude, we're gonna keep this podcast going because you said some 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 smart Alec remark last week about episode thirteen or podcast podcast episodes that get to thirteen oh, yeah. or something break up. Listen, man, we are gonna take him up on that offer, and we're gonna be on the sideline. All right, dude, that's gonna be incredible. We'll have a yep. we'll have to do we got another plus one situation. Boys. I'm bringing JJ. You bring Scotty, and let's go check it out because that would be a amazing time. Be amazing insane. time. Absolutely. And That's every awesome. fourth down, we go for it. I mean, if we're calling the plays, we're going hey, for it. Aggressive. I've, I've be, played enough Madden and Sega Genesis to know <laughs> you don't punt ever. If you want to win, Genesis, you don't punt. Prime time. One of the best football games ever. Woo woo. Thanks again, uh, Coach Stiggs. First off, shout out to my friend John. We're not going to use his last name. We're going to keep it mysterious. Who is absolutely instrumental on getting Coach Stig out on the on the podcast today? Thanks so much, John. But uh, yeah, dude, that's it. I mean, there's not really much else to talk about. Super Bowl. Lucky 13. About 10 days from here. Episode 13. Probably the best one yet still, man. Coach Stig is a big deal. It's insane. There's, that is a huge deal. That's a, that's a power program in the FCS. That's an absolute. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that FCS championship game was a second to last college game played this year. Is You know, is it, that's a. It's an absolute honor to have Coach Stig on there, and I cannot wait.
to be on the sideline. I am. I never expected that, but I'm going to take him up on that. I've always wanted to go to a game. Absolutely. Now, Road why would you not trip. Go? Dusty. Always a pleasure, man. Episode 13 of the books. We're going to do episode 14. Keep it chesky. Keep it chesky. Peace.